Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again tonight. This is the second season of the COE Learn at Home webinar series. And we are down to our seventh and last session for this season. Tonight, we will be tackling innovative pedagogies for remote teaching and learning, as well as facilitating and assessing online virtual classes. I am Ms. Chini, a faculty member of the USJR School of Education, your host for tonight at your service. To begin with, let us all observe a moment of silence as we say our opening prayer. Let us feel the presence of the Lord in our midst as we all say in the name of the Father, Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we receive all of God's love for us. Today we open ourselves to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today we open ourselves to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, we open ourselves to God's word so that we become more like Jesus every day. Today, we proclaim that we are God's beloved, we are God's servants, we are God's powerful champions. And because we are blessed, we are blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, for tonight, again, once again, I would like to express first my gratitude for all of you for being with us all throughout from the first season, first session, until now, our last session for this afternoon, for this evening, rather. I would like to uh, give, I, I would like already to give the floor to the person who will be giving the opening message for tonight, the newly appointed physical education chairperson, Mr. Montano Tapanan Jr. Good evening, Sir Montano. Yes, good evening, Madam Chini. And good evening also to our participants here in Zoom and to all our viewers in our YouTube channel. It's USJR College of Education. Dear speakers and colleagues, good evening. And welcome to our seventh session, second edition of our Learn at Home webinar series, School of Education, University of San Jose Recolens. With the pronouncement of the Department of Education to reset the opening of classes to October 5, the Filipino educators may be happy to be provided with ample time for preparations to this online teaching and learning. But still, we have this concern as a teacher or a student on how to teach on screen, how to recalibrate the online teaching pedagogies, how to assess learning virtually to still be fair and balanced. Hence, tonight will be the night for better insights and learning as we are going to listen to our distinguished speakers and to share their knowledge and expertise on facilitating and assessing in virtual classes and innovative pedagogies for remote teaching and learning. So these are the demands and challenges of everyone to ensure and maintain the quality and excellent educational learning experiences. Assessment process and innovative pedagogies are the features in teaching even without this pandemic. So hence, our anxieties and worries have increased since we need to embrace another learning modality to be in with this try, trying and difficult time. So learn best and continue to be inspired to become effective online learning facilitators. Sustain the interest and motivate more youngs to be better version of themselves in this flexible learning modality. So that will be all. Stay healthy, stay safe, and other Thank you so much, Sir Montano. Indeed, uh, what changed was, was just the learning environment. At the end of the day, we teachers will have to make our classes more interactive and fun. And nothing can replace the teacher. So we can, we'll just have to do our best and be there for each other and give our students 
quality education experience. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with our first speaker this evening, I would like again to present and reiterate very important um, house rules for this evening. Okay, so these are our rules. Make sure to keep your uh, microphones mute at, at all times for those who are with us here in Zoom, unless you're asked to unmute your microphone. And of course, it is recommended that you also keep your webcams off so that we will have a lighter traffic. Of course, since we are also live via YouTube. And questions will be entertained only during the open forum, which will be done after all the talks. There will be a question and answer you may um you may chat or comment your questions already so that uh, it will be acknowledged and as much as we want to answer them all this evening uh, we will only be choosing at least one per speaker if there is more time maybe we can cater to more questions and again if you have more questions please just message us in school of education facebook page and that's it. Thank you. Now I am ready to introduce to you our our speaker, first speaker for this evening. Shini, I guess I guess you forgot the rationale. Oh, okay. I apologize for for my mistake. There is still someone who would be giving us the rationale for this evening, equally competent. Now, still coming from the physical education department, I apologize. I'd like to call Mr. Benedict Candia for the rationale. Good evening, Sir Ben. Thank you so much, <laughs> Madam Chini. Thank you. Welcome to the University of San Jose Recoletas School of Education Learn at Home webinar series with a theme innovative pedagogies for remote teaching and learning and facilitating and assessing online virtual classes. For everyone's knowledge and attention, the host, University of San Jose Recoletas School of Education is located in Cebu City, Philippines, and is recognized by the Commission on Higher Education as the center of excellence in teacher education in the region. We thank you for your enormous response and participation to our previous webinar series that inspired us to continue to sh share our gifts and expertise for those who want to learn at the comforts of their home. We gathered around 5,000 views to 7,000 and 7,400 views to 10,000, 12,000 views, 16,000 views, and 39,000 views and as far as 43,000 views to prove that we have been connecting with you all for this learning opportunity. Hence, aside from learning at home, you will also be receiving the several perks for joining the series. First, is you acquire the new learning in the comforts of your home. Second, you can share them in your respective learning groups. Third, you receive a certificate of participation for every topic that you have attended. And lastly, you will also receive a certificate of completion once you finish the four webinar series for the month. I'm sure that all of you are excited for a session tonight. So sit back, relax, and have fun while learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Ben, for that. And we still... For those who are watching via Facebook Live, I mean via YouTube Live now, if you may please um, share to Facebook so that many people would still be alerted that we are having our Friday nights with the College of Education, now the School of Education, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker for this evening. Our first speaker for this evening is a certified Apple teacher. And he's an advocate of e-learning, literacy, teacher education, 
Student Affairs Program Development and Curriculum Development. He is a published researcher and a national trainer with interest on learner-centered instruction and has continually trained teachers and education leaders from the preschool and tertiary levels. Just recently, he published two professional education textbooks on technology for teaching and learning and the teacher and the community, school, school culture and organizational leadership. He has a Bachelor of Secondary Education major in English degree and is currently working on his master's degree at De La Salle University, Manila. Moreover, he's a licensed professional teacher and a member of the League of Catechists and Religious Educators of the Philippines at the Ateneo de Manila University. At present, he's connected with Colegio San Agustin Bacolod as a senior high school teacher and college instructor. Aside from being a full-time teacher, he is also a professional lecturer in the licensure examination for teachers in various review centers and universities in Bacolod City, Metro Manila, Quezon Province, Iloilo Province, Dumaguete City, and Zamboanga del Norte for the subjects Curriculum Development, Educational Technology, Teaching Profession, Social Dimensions of Education, and Facilitating Learning. He is currently the educational consultant of all the schools of the Oblates of Notre Dame Sisters all over the Philippines, Mater Carmeli Academy and Lecole Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, our highly esteemed speaker for this evening, Mr. Paul Raymark and Salsag. Good evening, sir, and we are very honored to have you here with us tonight. Hello, good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, USJR, University of San Jose Recoletos, School of Education, for this opportunity to share with you some thoughts on innovative pedagogies in this era of remote teaching and learning. I hope everyone is safe. I hope everyone is well. And I hope that we will be, uh, you will be learning from me tonight all about innovative pedagogies for this era of remote teaching and learning. Allow me to share my screen. So here it is. I hope that you can see that clearly. So you can call me Sir Paul. Most of my students, my colleagues, and also uh, other people in the friends in the academy would call me Sir Paul. So you can call me Sir Paul. I'm also like with University of San Jose Recoletos and Agustin in School St. Augustine. So tonight I will be sharing with you innovative pedagogies for remote teaching and learning. The world will never be the same again. And let's accept the fact that there are a lot of things that we are doing before that we can't do now. That there are things that were fond of doing with that there are old that we can't do now. So let's try to think also what are the things that you are fond of doing during in the classroom before in the old normal that you can't do now in the new normal. That's why one of the things that we need to do is that to mindset ourselves that the world will never be the same again. Sadly, basic education or even higher education will never be the same again. But also because of this new normal, there are a lot of anxieties. There are a lot of anxieties that gave, that is, uh, that is beset in each one of us. And also we have our shared concerns, may it be into economic, psychological, or social. Economic, there are a lot of people who will be asking that uh, if he or she will continue and it would be continued in his or her employment. May trabaho pa ba ako? But also psychological, paano na ang future namin? But most of the time, most of us are into psychological concerns. Even though you still have a job, even though you are still employed, that there are a lot of anxieties. Because also, not only the academe, but also the industry are being rewired. It was also being repurposed. Also, in terms of social, that we are living in a VUCA ecosystem. 
and we do not know what will happen later on. So we have a shared concerns, may it be economic, psychological, or social. If you try to take a look at statistics and studies, the traffic growth or decline due to COVID-19, that most of the industries are affected. That the number one industry that was greatly affected because of the pandemic is travel. And all other industries was greatly affected, followed by transportation, manufacturing, food, sometime, uh, for example, are also affected, advertising, construction, and also education. On the other hand, major industry disruptions, if we try to take a look, accommodation and food services, real estate, business and administrative services were greatly disrupted because of this pandemic. Also, let us accept the fact that we are also entering an era that there is a highest record of unemployment rate, that jobs were forced to retrench, that uh, many of the industries were forced to offer early retirement to their employees. And also schools are also one of the industry or societal institution that was greatly affected by this. I am also sad that uh, some of the schools that I know were closed simply because of this pandemic. But also, many of the schools who are thriving also, who continue to keep afloat even, the, we are experiencing this pandemic. Also, the intensified inability to access basic needs that many of us are experiencing pay cuts in our salaries. And also, many of the people or many of our friends abroad are locked down and they can't go home because of this pandemic. And if this was experienced by most of the schools, most of the private educational institutions, that given private educational institutions, the clientele of it are most of them are migrant or parents who are working abroad, parents who are working abroad. But if you try to take a look, these migrant workers don't have a job already abroad and they are in a lockdown and they can't go home, of course, they no longer have the resources to enroll their kids. That's why one thing, which is a great challenge for all educational institutions, uh, most especially private educational institutions, is this no turn out in terms of enrollment. Also, the large scale of displacement of citizens. This is the thing that I am talking about. If you try to take a look, most of this, of the Clienteles, no, the parents of our clienteles and private educational institutions don't have a job already abroad. They are migrant workers. And of course, they, are, uh, they can't now, well, they can no longer enroll their kids in the private school. And that is something that is challenging on our part in the private educational institutions. So this will lead to this continuity in schooling. This will lead to discontinuity in schooling. But then again, the Department of Education was, is firm in its directive. Learning must continue. If we try to take a look at the data of UNESCO, that there is a total of 28,451,212 affected learners due to school closures caused by COVID-19. If you try to analyze school closures, widen learning inequalities, and it hurt vulnerable children and the youth disproportionately. But also, we need to think about this as proposed and as given by experts in public health, as well as with researchers in allied health sciences, that this is not the last major outbreak we're ever going to see. That we need to establish a disruptive proof education in times like this, given that we are living in a VUCA ecosystem, in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous ecosystem. Volatile in a sense that the environment demands you to react quickly to ongoing changes in order for you to continue. That's why we need to be agile in our decisions, in our industries, and in our services that we are offering. So that's why we repurpose and we reward education in order for education to continue. But then again, even though we are firm in our decision in opening classes comes August 24 or comes October 5, we are still uncertain. 
that the environment requires us to take action without uncertainty. That there are a lot of schools who are still praying that they could still have face-to-face -face classes, maybe by end of the quarter or maybe by end of this excuse me, maybe by the end of the by December, maybe. But then again, we are uncertain. That's why the challenge is that we need to establish disruptive proof education so that we can continue education, we can continue in delivering educational services, even though there are a lot of disruptions that is going to happen, as well as complex, that the environment is dynamic with many interdependencies, and lastly, ambiguous, that the environment is unfamiliar outside of your expertise. Also, my dear teachers, let us accept the fact that we were not trained to teach in a remote teaching and learning. We are not trained to teach in a distance learning modality. That we are trained to teach in a face-to-face -face instruction. That's why capacity building of teachers are, are too many now. Uh, from the moment uh, that we are in a lockdown last three months ago up to this time, that there are a lot of webinars that is happening, that there are a lot of trainings given to teachers because of this concept of ambiguity, that we are in a scenario that we are caught off guard and we were not prepared ourselves to offer distance learning up to this time. But then again, the, our beloved commissioner, chairman rather of the Commission on Higher Education, J. Prospero de Vera III gave a statement that the approach to education should be anchored on the premise that learning must continue. Quarantine or not, learning must continue. Therefore, it is everybody's responsibility to ensure that flexible learning is delivered during and after the crisis. Higher education institutions are the repositories of innovation and the vanguards of change. I would like to focus my talk my sharing with you this webinar this evening on the word innovation. That if we try to take a look even before COVID-19 pandemic, we were speaking of innovative. We are speaking already of innovation. But then again, we are in a situation that we need to innovate far more than what we are doing before. Far more than what we are doing before. But then again, we need first to differentiate. It may be an isolated or it may be a grounded innovation. Let's try to differentiate. What is isolated innovation and what is this grounded innovation? That we innovate, but sometimes we were not able to see what is happening in the grassroots. That we innovate, but we was not able to take a look of the demographics of our students, the capacity of the students, but not only the capacity of the students, but also the capacity of our learners. Not only the capacity, but far more all about the readiness of our learners. How ready is our learners in terms of the innovation that you will be introducing? And how ready is your teachers in the innovation that you will be introducing? So what is this innovation? Allow me to share with you some things to tickle your mind about innovation. For example, in an innovation department, maybe we should try to think out of the box. But then again, some, not all, I'm not generalizing, some, not all, teachers are not ready in terms of innovation. That, uh, for example, I am giving trainings and seminars to teachers. There are teachers who would complain that, for example, they will, uh, I will ask them to make an online module or an offline module. They would simply say, I don't like to make online module. I don't like to make offline module too. And I would respond, what will you do now? What will you do now if you will not? Because that's the, that's the demand of the time now. Moving on. There are people also, some not all, who would simply say this, that in the corporate world, they pay you big bucks for thinking outside of the box. That some not all teachers would try to say that I will be making modules and then again, I need to have a paper module. I need to have a paper module. But also there are teachers who are complaining, for example, that they don't have laptops, they don't have uh, any technological tool on how to do it. But then again, in an era of 21st century, these technologies, laptops, iPads, tablets, are the basic need that a teacher needs to have. Or these are 
the basic tools that the teacher need to have. Like for example, if you will be asking a carpenter to make you a furniture, for example, or to a cabinet, and then the carpenter will ask you, do you have nails? Do you have a hammer? Of course, you will think about, are you a carpenter? As well as with that, with a teacher. That is a teacher, you need to have these tools already in the era of 21st century. But then again, there are some who are striving that Eureka, I've finally learned how to think outside of the box. Uh, there is uh, the National Educational Academy of the Philippines Director, Do Director John Arnold Shen mentioned last time that uh, uh, he do have uh, a professor in the College of Education of University of the Philippines, the Liman, who is uh, around maybe 60s or 70s. But then again, he mentioned that this certain professor is far more computer literate than him is far more innovative and is far more creative in using PowerPoint presentations or in making computer uh, productive in the use of productivity tools online. So that's why sometimes age is not a guarantee. You may, you may be a digital migrant, you may be a digital native, but it's more of exploring and learning ourselves. And it's more of honing the craft. It's more of about your mission as a teacher that you want to deliver innovative and quality education still in the midst of the pandemic. But of course, that being innovative is a process. That being innovative is not a one day. Uh, is not, it will not happen in one day long. It will not happen overnight. That there would be a long and a series of discussions that will happen later on. Like, for example, my team is having trouble thinking outside the box. We can't agree on the size of the box, what materials the box uh, should be constructed from, a reasonable budget for the box or our first choice of box vendors. For example, we're having our faculty meeting last time. That, For example, you are in a debate or you are in a commotion of what is the size of the module now, what is the band page, what is the, the font size, the font style, that uh, in the course of being innovative, there would be a challenge, that there would be a challenge. But it's not only, it's not all about the storm that you are experiencing now, but it is all about how did you become after that storm? How did you become after that storm? That's one thing that we need to remember, my dear teachers. How this COVID-19 pandemic brought you as a teacher now. If before you do not know how to use technology tools in your teaching and learning, in your teaching, but now you don't have any choice but to explore these tools in order for you to be engaging and to catch the attention of the students. Get back in the box and start thinking like the rest of us. You don't have a choice now. Thinking outside of the box didn't work. Thinking inside of the box didn't work. Maybe it's a defective box. Sometimes, uh, in the process of continuing to innovate, there are some who give up. Who can hear that I like in the Filipino language is padayon, that we need to continue. I'm from a college city. I'm from the city of smiles. That's one thing that I like with uh, sometimes no, most of uh, people coming from other municipalities, cities, and regions would always tell that these Bacolod people are smiling people. But then again, uh, of course, no, Dumaguete City, the land of the gentle people, is also good. But uh, in Bacolod City, sometimes they would uh, make a joke that uh, these uh, Bacolod City people or these Ilongos don't know how to, uh, yeah, they do not know how to be angry. They do not know how to be angry. That even though they are angry, they're still sweet. I don't know if, it's that, if that's true. So this one thing, that even though we are in a pandemic, we need to have this growth mindset and not fixed mindset. Let's try to talk about that later on. They only taught me how to think outside of the box and not train for circles. That's why the challenge for teachers now is to reskill, to upskill, to cross skill, to reskill, to cross skill, to upskill. I would like to highlight the word uh, cross skilling, cross skilling. That if before 
uh, computers, for example. Like this, what we are doing. Uh, streaming in YouTube Live is a work only of IT people. But then again, we need to cross-skill as teachers that we need to learn these uh, these things, these stuff, in order for us to deliver, for example, student services in our students. That we need to stream live, we need to make yourself presentable also online. That's one thing that we need to learn. That's why classroom management also has changed. That if before you can easily manage the students in the classroom, in the face-to-face -face classroom, but now we have this concept of virtual classroom management, that these teachers need also to be trained in terms of virtual classroom management. How to catch the attention of the students virtually is one thing that we need to think about also. And later on, Dave can think outside of the box, Larry can think outside of the bag, Sue can think outside of the cup, Vinny can think outside of the balloon, Lucy can think outside of the duffel bag, Mitch can think outside of the mitten, we're ready for anything. But in our own ways, we can. We can. I know we can. But then again, we are in the first week of classes to some schools. We are in uh, preparing for opening of classes. But the first time would always be a struggle. That the first time would always be a struggle. That there is no perfect first time. That we can't perfect the first time as long as you are learning in the process. Innovations in curriculum may it be in pedagogy and technology, must always be grounded in context. That this new normal, that this new normal is context-specific, as uh, Dr. Dina, teacher Dina Ocampo, who is also celebrating her birthday today, that she mentioned that this new normal is context-specific, that this new normal might be applicable in that specific school that might not be applicable in my school that we need to be grounded in terms of innovating. That there is this concept of grounded innovation and not that of isolating that innovation. One thing that we innovate now, that we are facing now as teachers, is that we are migrating ourselves from a residential or a classroom-based learning to a home-based learning. That the, that the home now is the new school that the home now is the new school. But there are a lot of ways on how to engage the students at home. The, the challenge for us teachers is on how to catch attention, on how can we still continue students are at the comforts of their home, or even us teachers are in the comforts of our home also. That there is a challenging way, there is a right way, a hard way, it may be a difficult way, an ambitious way, or a slow way, but there is our very own way. That, for example, pedagogy depends on the personality of the teacher. It depends on the personality of the teacher. And don't ever imitate the pedagogy of others, because the pedagogy of others might not be applicable to you. That pedagogy is primarily based on the personality of someone. Our way can mean so many things. Substitution, like for example, we are now using conferencing applications, Zoom, Google Meet, Google, uh, Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx, and PowerPoint presentations instead of classroom-based learning and a chalkboard. Alteration, that we revised our syllabi and curriculum maps for the basic education to identify now the most essential learning competencies and outcomes. That we focus now on the essentials, Perturbations from residential learning to a distance or a blended learning. Restructuring. Restructuring. Shifting from a teacher-focused instruction to a learner-centered instruction. If before you are a sage on the stage, now you don't have any choice but to be fully a guide on the side, a facilitator of the teaching and learning process. Not only a facilitator, but your role now is not only to facilitate, but to design a learning experience. Value orientation, enhancing school structures and learning processes with digital and mobile learning tools. Our, huge, our response to innovation makes a huge difference. Even if we would try to focus ourselves lang on restructuring and value orientation, that we've restructured, not only restructured, but we rewired education. 
we rewired education. The COVID-19 finally made us push the button for rewiring and not just for constantly rebooting education. Because if you rebooted education, you will only fall asleep and in the moment that you wake up, it's still the same. But rewiring is changing a lot in order for you to continue education. That's why uh, there is this quote, you can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Nga sabi nila, no, kapag hindi ka pa nakapag-move on, walang mangyayaring maganda sa'yo. Mag-move on ka na. That's one thing. Apply that in education. If you can't move on with your chalkboard, if you can't move on with your face-to-face instruction, I do not know that if quality education will still be delivered, if that is the case. But then again, in decisions, in decisions, we offer three kinds of services. Good, cheap, or fast. This is a word of caution. If you continue to be good and you are cheap, you won't be fast. If you continue to be cheap and if you are fast at the same time, you're cheap na nga and then you make it fast pa, it, you, you won't be good. But what is this COVID-19 pandemic is demanding us educational leaders or teachers that you need to be fast in your decisions, but you need to be good, but you need to give good decisions in order for you not to be cheap. Act in a quick manner, but don't forget that you act or you decide or you give good decisions in order for you not to be cheap. New normal, you have new three hours. In the new normal, we have new roles as teachers, that you are no longer a, you're no longer a stage on the stage, but you are now a facilitator, a designer of a learning experience. But do not forget to give the students also new rules and new routines in terms of education, that we are living in a new normal, new normal with new infrastructures. Let's try to talk about that one by one. New infrastructures in terms of daily schedules, school rituals, and platform. New systems in terms of attendance, discipline, and also requirements. New approaches, student engagement, student formation. My role this evening is to talk about new approaches on how these students now can be engaged and on how these students would be formed in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of this new normal, in the midst of this home-based learning, and as well as new culture. Class routines, classroom management, which is now virtual classroom management on how you can manage the classroom virtually. Digital transformation framework. I would like to talk about this. This is a Microsoft, a digital transformation framework that is in the white paper of the education transformation framework for higher education of Microsoft. I, I, am, I am a bit sad that most of educational leaders, for them, to keep afloat in this new normal is to buy a learning management system. That the moment that they bought the learning management system, they can still deliver quality education. And I beg to disagree. That this learning management system is but only a tool in terms of quality education. It's only a part of this digital transformation framework. That we need to think about also many components of the transformation. Student success, secure and connected campus, and academic research. That it's not only all about learning management, but it's also all about collaborative learning. It's, only, it's not only all about learning management, but it's also all about learning spaces. And it's not only all about learning management, but it's also all about teaching the students future-ready skills. That it's not only all about the learning management systems, that, of course, the usage of learning management systems do have also a lot of misconceptions that we are doing up to this time. But let's try to talk about new gojis. Utagoji, Piragoji, and Cybergoji. That we are entering an era that Utagoji, that we encourage learners to become more self-directed. That we are teaching the kids to be responsible in the learning. Piragoji, that we focus or we design learning experiences that the students now is co-learning and co-creating at the same time through the infusion of collaborative activities online. Cybergoji, of course, that we encourage learner engagement in an online environment. The challenge is that, how to engage the students in an online environment, something that we take 
for granted for how many years? If you try to take a look, learning management system has existed for how many years already? Blackboard is the first learning management system. But sadly, these learning management systems was not given due importance. But now, it was given due importance because it was able to see now the relevance of this learning management systems. But so what? In a ladder, most of us, most of us are here. How to do it? But there are a lot of dilemmas. There are a lot still of anxieties for us teachers. How do I do it? How to teach now in a learning management system? How to teach now, for example, having only one hour in one subject a week? How can I squeeze a lot of competencies and a lot of contents in one hour? This one of the, those are things that teachers are thinking about or asking for answers for these questions. But I would like to introduce this innovation mindset that we need to be more curious than certain. Of course, teachers, uh, once a teacher for ever a student, there's one thing that we need to think about. It's a teachers, once a teacher for ever a student. That we don't have any reason not to be resourceful, not to be innovative. That we are teachers, of course, we were born to be innovative. That we need to be more curious than certain. But then again, let's try to talk about having an innovative mindset. For example, if you focus only on problems, schools are closed and children are learning from home. That's the problem. Let's try to how a fixed mindset answer that problem. I can't learn if I can go to school. Close the school. So it's a bit something that is, of course, it's not, uh, it's not good to do. If you're having a growth mindset, I can keep learning if I put in the effort and stay motivated. But on the other hand, if you are innovative, I have a unique opportunity to learn new skills and try something I've never done before. Be innovative. Be more curious than certain. We are living in an era that in a knowledge economy, that knowledge tends to be ubiquitous, that it can be accessed now anywhere at any time. And that's the challenge for us teachers, that we are no longer the sole source of information, that in just one step and in just one click of the kids, they can access information. And we are living in a knowledge economy. Knowledge economy is, of course, gave us also a lot of skills that we need to hone to our students. And I would like to focus on this novel and adaptive thinking, that we are living in an era that we need to think and come up with creative solutions. And one thing that I like most and one thing that I am into now is into design thinking or having a design mindset that we need to represent and develop tasks and work processes for desired outcomes. Of course, we are living in a fourth industrial revolution, which is characterized by driverless cars, smart robotics, materials that are lighter and tougher, and a manufacturing process built around 3D painting, uh, 3D printing rather, sorry. Going back to the Department of Education, the curriculum needs to be flexible. We have this concept of flexible learning. And we are entering an era of flexible learning, not only in the basic education, but also in the higher education. Blended learning is flexible learning. Hinging from the definition of Dr. Edison Fermin, as well as the definition was, that was adopted also by the Shed Memorandum Order on Flexible Learning, that flexible learning is the overaching approach. It's the overaching approach. That flexible learning is not only all about course delivery, but it's also all about the programs, the totality of programs, and the totality of intervention. That we are entering an era of flexible learning. That we are flexible, that we deliver academic services, and we are flexible in terms of pace, place, process, and products of our students. That they need to think about in designing instruction now, the pace of the students, the place on where they will access the learning materials, for example, as well as the process, the teaching and learning process need also to be flexible 
and as well as the products that we are asking for the students. But then again, even though we are in a flexible learning, these flexible learning still focus on essential experiences, essential content, and essential outcomes. And also, it promotes learner control and customizability. We just need to know the best modality. If you try to insist still on residential learning, residential learning is not a disruptive proof education. Why? It's more of face-to-face -face provision, but less of remote provisions. On the other hand, if you will insist on open or distance learning, it's more of remote provision, but the time, for example, comes January or comes by next year that vaccine would be made available, we have this face-to-face -face provision, but in an open or distance learning, it, do have, uh, it don't have face-to-face -face provisions. Blended or hybrid learning, do have remote provisions and also unlimited face-to-face -face provisions. That's why we just need to know the best modality. I would like to focus now on how to design lessons, on how to design remote and teaching and learning experience to our students. Of course, we focus still on the learning outcomes, the institutional priorities, and the industry requirements. And that is where the flexible learning will come in in terms of pace, in terms of place, in terms of process, and in terms of product. In terms of pace, where can I go through the experience? The experience may be teacher-led or self-paced. If teacher-led experience, is it synchronous or in real time that you're having virtual classes? Or asynchronous that you design learning modules that is uploaded in the learning management system that can be accessed by the students? Self-paced, it may be independent or guided. The place need also to be given emphasis. Where can I experience learning? Residential, distance, or remote? Residential, is it classroom or site-specific? Distance, is it uh, wired or non-wired? The process, it may be modular, printed, or non-printed. Simulative, lab job based remote? The product, is it traditional, manual, automated, non-traditional for actual performance and recorded performance? Excuse me for a while, I lost my PowerPoint presentation. So those are the things that we need to think about. But then again, we need to think about that technology will never replace the teacher. But the teacher who doesn't use technology will be replaced by someone who uses technology. Allow me to share with you three things to cap my presentation this evening. Number one, in having remote teaching and learning, how to be engaging, include family members. That's one thing. That in the design of our teaching and learning process, in the design of our remote teaching and learning, include family members. Design experiences that engage students in simulation, role plays and interviews, and do shared reading exercises and ask the students to share day-to-day -day like errands, laundry, cooking, household chores. Number two, Include physical objects. Access their physical space. Use items around the house such as pictures, heirlooms, clothing, kitchen utensils in learning experiences and as props. Design experiences that is not only all about reading something and asking them to answer something. Include physical objects at home that would make these learning meaningful to the students. And lastly, include open-ended questions. Invite students to consider questions that don't have specific answers, that you develop still their critical thinking, and analyze, deconstruct, and redesign things they are curious about. Allow me to, to summarize what we've talked about this evening. Before COVID-19, you are into an entire stretch of learning outcomes. During COVID-19, you need to focus now on essential learning outcomes. Before COVID-19, you design almost endless content. But now you need to design around a limited content. But you need to focus on the essential. What are the things that the students need to learn? Teacher-driven learning experiences before COVID-19. But now, during COVID-19, you need to take a look or you need to think about that these experiences are now learner-driven. And before COVID-19, content focus assessments. And during COVID-19, we are now into experience-focused. In the old normal, we are in this co-kitchen. Give man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. In the interim normal, some, not all, people are into this. 
I don't know how to fish. I don't care to learn. I don't even like to fish. So don't bother me. I'm motivated. But in the no normal, if you give me a fish, you have fed me for a day. If you teach me to fish, then you have fed me until the river is contaminated or the shoreline ceases for development. Sometimes that's that's right, di ba? Paano kapag nag-oil spill? But if you teach me to organize, then whatever the challenge, I can join together with my peers and we'll fashion our own solution. And that is in the new normal. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Paul, for that very insightful um, talk. Indeed, there are a lot of changes in the new normal and we are all um, trying to adapt. And what you have talked about right now has really helped us, including myself as a teacher, um, to do more for our students. No? Um, thank you so much, Sir Paul, for that. This time... Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker for this evening. Our next speaker for this evening is a Master of Education, major in English as a second language, and he graduated from the University of the Philippines, Cebu. He's currently finishing his PhD in English language in the University of San Jose Recoletas Arts and Sciences. He's a Philippine Normal University Research Center for Teacher Quality Curriculum Audit, Specialist and Prototype Syllabi Writer for English Specialization Subjects, Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert Philippines from the year 2018 to up to the present. And currently, ladies and gentlemen, he's our very own chairperson of the School of Education of in the Department of Teacher Education in the University of San Jose Recoletas. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give our hearts and thumbs up to our very own Mr. Ayonel J. Terogo. Good evening, Sir Ayo. We're glad to have you back. Sir Ayo, are you with us? Did his PowerPoint. Ladies and gentlemen, again, if you have questions about our um, topic. Hello. Hi. Hi, sir. I, I was just telling the viewers that if they have questions about our previous topic, <laughs> now sir Ayo is with us. Sir Ayo, are you ready? Hi. Yes. Okay, take it away, Sir Ayo. Uh, liked or shared yet our YouTube channel, please? like subscribe and share so that we'll have um we will be able to reach more teachers and students who will be needing more of our content sir ayo sir ayo is trying to fix his internet connection probably but he'll be with us so Sir, since Sir Ayo is still um, having technical troubles, I will first um, give you a few reminders regarding your um, certificate. Since it's the seventh and the last um, session for this season, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind all of you to please prepare all the certificates that you got from our previous sessions. And please be ready and be uh, please be ready to have them posted via Facebook, just like the last time. This time, um, Sir Ayo, are you with us already? Yes, hi. Yes, can I be heard? 
Yes. Thank you. Very good. We are not really friends. <laughs> Hear you already. Hear you. so much for your patience um i will not going to show myself uh because um again of connectivity issues and that's okay and that's always part of um the um minimum uh things that we can't uh uh go through with um online classes so anyway uh, again i'm sir ayo at your service and i'm going to talk about facilitating and assessing online virtual classes um, to really assist you while you are listening with my talk this um, evening, I'm going to share to you the outline of topics. I'm going to model also how you're going to teach online. So teachers out there, hi. Uh, you're going to start with an outline of topics or um, a set of objectives or competencies that you have to share to your students. Uh, sometimes we forget sharing objectives while we are in a face-to-face -face class. But in an online class, we need to share them because we are really far from students. There's that remoteness uh, uh, with students. Therefore, they have to know what we are doing. So the outline of our topics tonight would be, first, instructor presence in online classes. How, are they, uh, how is it very important in online classes? Number two, we will spotlight or give the spotlight to virtual classes. 
um, C, how to assess online. Then I'm going to give some tools for feedbacking and grades. Sadly, I cannot share how to do them, but at least I can share you these tools and you can explore them by yourselves. And last but not the least, as a challenge for us uh, this evening would be growth mindset and empathy. They are very important now in an online virtual class. Uh, teachers and students alike, this will be our outcome for tonight. Out outcomes for tonight. Outcome number one, to recognize instructor presence in facilitating online classes. The strategies that I'm going to share tonight might be forgotten, but I don't want you to forget how important instructor presence is in an online setting. And number two, um, another important thing that we have to consider is feedback. Whatever strategy you do, as long as you always think of feedback, then hopefully you are trying to feedback as relevant means in assessing online. So two important words for outcomes for tonight, instructor presence and feedback. With that, are you still with me? Hopefully, you're able to follow. Yes, sir. We are following. Thank you so much. Now, that's me on the screen. Hi. I'm sitting down because I'm lazy. And let's discuss again change of delivery. So, hi. I'm Sir Ayo at your service. And this is done through face-to-face -face classroom interaction with the blackboard or the whiteboard the back and with your handsome teacher in front or your beautiful teacher in front. Uh, camaraderie, collaboration is clear. There is that um, focus on interaction with um, students and teacher and students and students. But again, uh, thank you to Sir Paul for really sharing and giving, a, a, a giving an outline and a glimpse as to the condition of um, online remote uh, learning and how to become innovative we are shifting now to a change of delivery. So just imagine that Sir Ayo as an avatar. Hi, I'm Sir Ayo at your service. And maybe I'm using Facebook group as a means to teach my students. That is now through online virtual class. There's really that change of delivery. But the commitment and even the resilience of teachers did not change. It's still there. And it's stronger than ever. So hopefully, my dear uh, students there who are listening, shout out to my students. <laughs> shout out. No? Um, shout out to my students. Please respect your teachers, especially at this time of crisis. They are doing the best that they could. Now, again, two modes of delivery. Are they the same? Are they different? What makes them different? Now, what makes them Similar, let's start first with similar, then different, and I'll go back to what is what should be the same in both deliveries. What is similar? Teachers. Teachers are still there. They're still present. They're still important in the teaching learning process, both face-to-face -face and more the more and all the more in online classes. Students, still the same, right? Uh, still needing the help and the guidance of teachers. Uh, in my case, I call them mga <laughs> kigwa they, they, they're, they're still the students that we know. And they still need guidance. That's why you are there to help them and facilitate them. And they're still curious. They're still um, energetic towards learning what they're supposed to do. Some of them might also be bored. And that's normal. Still the same. What is different? The learning environment. So the learning environment in face-to-face -face classroom interaction is, of course, the classroom. And the camaraderie and the collaboration that is present while the teacher and students are interacting. But in an online virtual class, sadly, you cannot feel that camaraderie because you are away. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm facing the screen and I don't know if you're still there with me, right? And I'm just trusting that you are with me and listening. And I also trust the internet for being with me. <laughs> so uh, the, the change is on the learning environment. The change is on how to make sure that learning still pursue with a change of the mode of delivery, with a, the with a change of trying to make sure that students still should be learning. And we also trust that students will have the capacity and will also have the responsibility to learn by themselves because they are left by themselves now. Now, question, my dear teachers, if this is the scenario, therefore, what... What would glue 
um, the online virtual class scenario to what students should be learning with a concern that teachers have? The answer is instructor presence. Can you type on the YouTube chat, um, chat box or in the YouTube comment box the word instructor presence without looking at your keyboard? Let me check if you are following with me, if you're still with me. Can you chat uh, instructor presence without looking at the keyboard? There. Instructor presence should be the same because the teacher, in as much as the learners are the heart of the teaching learning process, the teacher or the instructor is the most important factor in the success of the teaching learning process. It's really the it's really how teachers must uh, make sure that they are there with the students because whatever it is that they're going to do is what makes them what makes the teaching learning process important and successful and relevant. So what then is instructor presence? Instructor presence means creating the perception for your students that you are right there with them in the process of learning. And uh, my dear teachers and students, instructor presence here would mean um, regardless if it's online or face-to-face, -face, instructor presence is that perception of students that they know that you are with them. Is it possible that there is no instructor presence even if the teacher is physically there? The answer is yes, of course. An absent-minded teacher, a teacher who doesn't have any care for his or her students, that might mean that the teacher or the, the, the teacher is not really trying to show his or her presence with students. And that's sad. Because again, we are the teachers. We are the most important factor of success in the teaching learning process. Hathcock in 2012 says, in, it, in terms of online course, instructor presence is vital in an online course because without it, the class becomes an impersonal experience guided only by text and other electronic medium. Meaning, we don't want that students would feel that you are not with them. We don't want the learning to become an impersonal experience. It has to be personal. It has to be, there has to be that touch of the teacher trying to attach himself towards what students should be learning. Because what makes um, teaching and learning fun and great is what students would feel with you in the process of learning. They might forget what they learned with you, the content, the books, but they will never forget what they feel whenever they are with you in the process of teaching and learning. So that's why we have to let them feel that you are with them. That's why the important term for tonight, instructor presence. Chini, uh, am I still alive? Yes. Oh, very good. You're very loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm going to share right away now the strategies on how to facilitate. Uh, I'm going to share to you right now the strategies. So if instructor presence is important then, therefore, what are some strategies to facilitate classes online with the focus on instructor presence? Number one. Help students know more about you. So you share your picture, you share your avatar. That's why you see in my slides that the avatar because I really see that I will have difficulty with connection. So at least I am avatarly present. Okay. <laughs> uh, your avatar, you present to your students your philosophy of teaching, your interests, your researches perhaps. You could show them a video of yourself, right? To increase instructor presence or to have a feel of uh, instructor presence. Number two, each week, hopefully on a Monday or maybe when you end the week, you are going to post now sync asynchronously in your learning management system uh, a supportive note about what will happen next week. So at least you let them feel that you are with them by giving them the course outcomes for next week, the expectations for next week, the overview of what is going to happen next week, comment on current events that could also be what you can do with your students as well. Maybe you can say, uh, I, I think you've heard about what happened in Masbate and hopefully you are safe there with your families. Uh, th that line alone would tell instructor presence that you are with them and you know what is happening and you are taking care of them even in a virtual essence. Also, uh, one strategy that you can do 
is when you give out your slides, when you give out your uh, materials to students, maybe you can add your own voice, narrate the slides. And teachers, when you narrate the slides, please use a conversational tone, not much of a very formal uh, tone because it would sound very boring. Make sure that you use a conversational tone. Hopefully, that's what I'm letting you feel right now with what I'm doing. I'm trying to be conversational. We employ you more. We include anecdotes, we include examples, and or storytelling. I am sure that you teachers are also doing these inside the classroom. So why will you stop? Why will you not do it also in narrating your slides or your materials? Next. Also, let students know that you are logging in in the course site, in your learning management system, in your Facebook group, in your Google Classroom, in your Moodle, in your Canvas, and in USJR in Brightspace. You log in several times during the week. Then maybe leave announcements, a note to students, or maybe you post on the discussion board. What do you think about our topic today? Why is creative thinking important? For example, if that's the topic, you post on the discussion board. Next. You anticipate questions ahead, and therefore, you post an FAQ in your um, LMS, in your, um, learning management, uh, in your learning management system, or wherever it is that you are communicating with students. Consider having an instant messenger tool also set up during the week. So uh, this week, actually, I'm opening up to the students under the Department of Teacher Education how they can communicate with teachers because we believe that it's always about communicating. It's always about letting students feel that you are with them, instructor presence. So therefore, you are teachers should be open with students' questions and inquiries because that's how they learn, right? Especially now in a virtual online setting. Also, when you give out some materials and resources to students, you provide few sentences to accompany the resource or the material that you're going to attach. So example, you might say, attached uh, here with is the resource material that you can read about our topic. This, uh, this material, this reading coming from this website talks about blah, 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 blah. And hopefully that you will learn from this reading about blah, 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 blah. Enjoy learning, right? So you provide few sentences. The few sentences there is you. That's you as the teacher in which you're explaining what is actually in the material, which would be relevant to your teaching and learning. I got this from uh, University of North Texas Teaching Commons. Other strategies which would be summed up with two words, encouragement and relevance. So provide encouragement and create relevance. Teachers, our students will need encouragement more than ever now in an online setup. So we need to give that freely. So that's free. Encouragement is free. Right? We can just give them, kaya mo yan, laban. I always say word laban. Uh, always saying laban, hindi naman pinaglaban. Right? So we always, <laughs> we always say um, encouraging words with our students. You can do it. It might be difficult, but you can do it. I believe in you. These are encouraging words. You attach them in whatever posts you do, in the materials that you share. And you create relevance as well to what you are sharing, to what you're uh, posting. It's not enough that you're just going to post the material. No, it doesn't work that way. So if, if I were the student, I will think, oh, what's with this material, ma'am, sir? I will not read it. I, you did not tell me what to do with it. Right? It might sound being philosophical, but it makes sense, diba? You're going to post it there. Therefore, it, there has to be relevance as to why you are posting that material or resource with them. So you need to create relevance. You explain to students, my dear teachers, what makes the content relevant. We help maintain students' good attitude towards learning by encouraging them and by giving a support to them. Therefore, you are creating a good, supportive learning environment. Here are some sample statements. Number one, while learning how to cite sources correctly can seem difficult at first, practice will definitely make it easier. Uh, so there's an encouragement there. It's going to be difficult, but it's going to be easier once you do practice. Or you can say, if you're worried that you will never memorize all the citation rules, try to relax. This is something you just need to know how to look up. So you don't need to memorize them. So you need to encourage students to study citation rules, but no need for memorizing just to look them up. 
Or another example, are you struggling with the idea of rhetorical devices in language? If so, you're not alone. Here are some links that will help you learn more. I am very passionate about the strategies that I'm sharing because I'm also doing them in my classes. And I really believe that it has never been about what the content that I shared, but it's always been about letting my students feel that I am with them. That's why instructor presence is important. Here are some examples of what I can show you as to what I have been doing in my classes uh, as proof that I'm doing instructor presence, which you can also do. So, example, in the Moodle that we did last summer, I indicated an overview of the week. Then I'm going to share outcomes. Then I'm going to tell them also of what is the content for that week. I even said good luck. Uh, on the bottom left, I shared a comment of the current event. I commented on how they did a good job on the classroom management simulation performance in my EdPT2 class last semester. So I commented on a current event. Then I gave them expectations to what will happen next week. Uh, we are all set now for the next and final challenge, which is the teaching demonstration. So I'm giving them an expectation that next up is the teaching demo, which is our performance. I did this as, an, as a support to my face-to-face -face class last semester. So last semester, we had face-to-face -face classes, but I use Facebook group as means to communicate and do instructor presence, even if I'm not already around in the classroom. Uh, in my Ed English Major 3 class, Language, Culture, and Society, I employed humor, I presented some um, videos and links, and I gave notes to students too. Um, last, uh, last, summer, last summer term, I did a discussion board with my students when we discussed about, or when we did a recap on the 21st century skills. You can do that as well. I provided encouragement when I told them about grades because they have been asking about grades, to keep everyone at ease, as a lot of you have been asking about your submissions, I'm going to attach screenshots of our temporary class record. So that is to provide encouragement, being open to questions. I told them they can communicate from me from time to time if they have questions about their submissions. Also, um, on the right uh, bottom, I, present, I gave a material, then I explained the resource or the material. I, I said, simply put, design thinking process and its framework depend on creativity because the material or the resource that I'm sharing is about creativity in design thinking. Then I explained in two to three sentences what design thinking and creativity is. So this is, again, how you're going to uh, establish instructor presence. Let me now proceed to synchronous classes. Instructor presence would be needed in an asynchronous class. Uh, if you notice, most of my examples are asynchronous activities. So the students must still feel that you are with them, and that is very important in a synchronous class. That is why we need to do synchronous classes or synchronous activities so that we could hype up more the, uh, the teacher or the instructor presence. That's why synchronous classes. According to Hay in teachtaught.com, synchronous learning is when students learn the same thing at the same time through a lecture, online, or in person, for example. So again, this is not, synchronous learning has always been there. And that's what we have been really using. And we believe in the good benefits, oh, benefits are always good, no? Uh, in, the, <laughs> in the benefits of synchronous, face-to-face -face teaching. That's why right now when we are doing online uh, delivery mode, we need to incorporate synchronous classes because, again, we have to attach that sense of instructor presence with students. Wikipedia says that synchronous learning can be facilitated by having students and instructors participate in a class via a web conferencing tool. This is through online means. And again, the purpose why we do synchronous learning is to develop and strengthen instructor to student and student to student relationships, which can be challenged, which can be a challenge in distance learning programs. Because again, when students feel detached, when students feel remote, that they are already remote, then they feel pa, they feel pa naman that they are also very far from their teachers and their classmates, the more they don't want to learn. That's why we need to uh, put them together as one and we have to exude that instructor presence. That's why synchronous learning would be a way to really uh, make sure that instructor presence is present. 
So these are some strategies on how to facilitate classes that are synchronous. And uh, you look at my avatar at the right, it says no ten. So you have to know all of these strategies, okay? First, it's better before synchronous classes, you collect information about them to prepare appropriate materials, also to show interest. So maybe before you will have your very first synchronous class, you email them, you chat with them, you ask them, how are you? Kamusta? Uh, what, are you what have you been doing today? I see that, uh, because you're already friends with the students, I see that you have been selling already. What is it that you're selling right now? Diba? Uh, tapos na bang mag-change ng profile pic? Tapos na bang mag- a TikTok, ganun. So, you, you could actually chat with them, collect information from students just to uh, make them at ease with you. Um, it, it's going to be really difficult, my dear teachers, if you're just going to have the first meeting or the first interaction with them in a synchronous way. No, it's, it's not going to really work, especially in an online setting. So, you still have to warm up everyone by contacting them ahead before really doing a synchronous class. Okay? Number two, before synchronous class, you tell the students what to expect. Um, your first synchronous class and in your next synchronous classes, you email, you tell, you put in the LMS topics or questions the session will cover, how they should prepare, what they'll be expected to do, and be concrete and specific in those expectations, in, in the overview of your synchronous class. Because, why is this needed? Because students, if you, if we, whether we like it or not, may have the opportunity to not do or to not go or attend a synchronous class. Because we don't know eh, what is really happening with them. Diba? They might just say that um, uh, they were not able to have a good connection. Um, they're having difficulty. So you have to put relevance. We need to do synchronous class because I'm going to discuss this during the synchronous class. Okay? And therefore, they would want to come to the class. That's why the third strategy is make class relevant. Highlight what you're going to do in the synchronous class. Example, what are the characteristics of the most and least effective teams you've been part of? What specific things can you do to make the teams you lead function well? We will discuss these questions in this week's synchronous session. So telling them what is going to happen at the synchronous session will give them the choice. Ah, I need to attend the class because it's going to be important. Now, what are some strategies that you can do to facilitate the learners during synchronous classes? One strategy is you ask or you ask them to ask you a burning question. So you already gave them the topic, you already gave them the outcomes for the lesson. You let them uh, chat. You let them give to you through email or I don't know how you're going, how they're going to communicate with you a burning question about the topic. This is a pre-activity. This is also a formative activity. This kindles interest in the class or topic. Therefore, you know what students are thinking as well. Number two, during synchronous class, you make sure that whatever you are sharing is new. It's novel. Because if students will feel that it's not new, ah, I can just learn this online, why do I have to attend this synchronous class? Sadly, they will cut, they will leave. So therefore, you need to offer new content or insights. This is a reminder, my dear teachers. That's why we need to avoid duplicating the readings, the videos, the discussion boards. We have to synthesize something new so that they would like to learn or listen to you. That's why a term here is added benefit. Meaning, learners must think that when they joined your synchronous class, there is an added benefit to them. Okay, So can you chat in the YouTube comment box the word added benefit if you're still with me? Ms. Chini, are you still with me? Are, are, are people still with me? Yes. Very sure good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interactive. In Thank you so box. much. Yes. Um, again, the word is added benefit. Okay. Next. This is just an encouragement to encourage cameras to be on because turning the camera on creates a sense of connection and accountability that can help overcome disconnected people, disconnected students, being disconnected. You can always elect to turn them off if bandwidth issues are right. Just like what I'm doing now, I'm turning off my videos, sorry to say, my dear friends. Um, with that, it would be best if there would be a time for you to turn on the videos 
maybe in the beginning of the class or maybe at the end of the session uh, just to see uh, your students. Okay? That would create a sense of connection. Now, as a reminder about uh, bandwidth issues and um, connectivity issues and using videos, here are some tips for students with slow internet. And teachers, we could not enforce to students ha, that they have to turn on their cameras. The, the culprit is our own internet connection, <laughs> our internet connectivity in the Philippines. But we would still would want them to learn. So therefore, here are some tips. I'm just showing this to you. Okay. One important, um, uh, some important tips here that I'm doing is to turn the camera off during video calls. And maybe we could use a telephone, perhaps. Just call in, that's possible. Or audio lang, okay? That's actually possible. Next. Also, during synchronous classes, do a quick social check-in. So it's a social check-in. Maybe while waiting for all to arrive in the chat room, in the Google Meet, in the Zoom, in Microsoft Teams, and in what in Messenger Rooms. Meron na palang Messenger Rooms. You can also use that. Diba? Pwede naman. Use the time while waiting for others to chat. Uy, kumusta? Amusta na yung alaga mong pusa? Ganon. Uh, <laughs> I love cats, by the way. That's why. Um, use the time to chat. Uh, ask about their lives. You chit-chat with them a little. Or maybe, maybe, uh, just a strategy. You can preload a slide. You can you can show a slide to to the people to your class to your class to your students about a current event or a cartoon or a music or a, a, a music or trivia question to spark talk. Again, that is to let them feel camaraderie. Again, we're still hitting instructor presence here. Okay. You can also as a strategy post questions and give participants time to write. Diba? It's an uh, it's an uh, it's an alt, uh, you need to alternate whole whole group response and also individual responses. Okay, so maybe you can do a cold calling, meaning cold call is a strategy that teachers do when they call out students right away and they answer. Okay, that's cold calling, cold call. So example, uh, ifinita, what are the three elements of the teaching learning process? Okay, that's cold calling. You can also do that, actually, in a synchronous class. But please focus on um, objective questions or those questions with correct answers. But from time to time, my dear teachers, you also give time for students to reflect, to write, okay? Alternate the strategy. Um, letting them write actually would allow students to also synthesize what they actually have learned in the class, okay? Let them use the chat box or let them... A type in a third-party app, just like the Padlet. That's also a very good app. It's like a stick notes on the wall. Or pe Mentimeter. Uh, I, I also love Mentimeter. You can also do Kahoot, guys. Kahoot is also available for polls and surveys. Next, another strategy, my dear teachers, is to ask students to answer hot questions. Maybe a question about picking a side. Um, because these questions about picking a side what do they believe more? What do they think? Which is better, this or this? It's actually very hot, higher order thinking skills. And therefore, you could entice discussion with your students. Then maybe ask few learners to explain or defend their positions. And you can now have good discussion with students. And it's going to be a very interactive synchronous class. But take, uh, please make sure of the time. Okay. Next. Also, which is a very good strategy as well, you might not want to share content during the syn synchronous class, but rather make use of the synchronous class as consultation time. So let's do the flip strategy or flip classroom strategy. Flip classroom strategy is when you give students the opportunity to learn it by themselves. Then once you meet, that's the time that you answer questions about what they learn. So we are flipping the way on how to learn. So maybe, dear teachers, you can use the synchronous sessions not as content sharing, not, not as discussion, but perhaps a consultation. Okay, I'm, op I'm open now for synchronous session. I'm just going to be open to your questions or to what you would ask me about your tasks or your project. Okay, no, you can do that as well. Right? That is also adding uh, to, the, to the possibility or the strategy of uh, responsibility with students. 
So we are done with um, instructor presence, and I hope you've learned a lot as to how important instructor presence is. And I have a lot of strategies how to assure that instructor presence is there in asynchronous classes, and especially number two, synchronous classes. And I have strategies also that I shared to you how to deal with synchronous classes. Let's now go to an issue which is actually a hot topic in online classes and also difficult to do. That's assessment, online assessment. So coming from the Learning to Teach Online course that I attended in Coursera, what are the benefits of online assessment? So I'm going to sell to you, my dear teachers, that online assessment is actually beneficial. Why is that? Number one, it's very convenient, teacher and students. It's very convenient when it comes to submission. Can you imagine? There's no need for students to give you the book, to give you a hard copy. And then there's really that tendency pa that the hard copies that they're going to give to you mawawala pa or kinain ng aso, kinain ng pusa. Di ba? So when they're going to submit files digitally, then you know that it's there, right? So convenience in submission. Also convenience in marking. Just imagine the number of hours it will take for a teacher to check on your wrong answers. Diba? <laughs> so, nag-check nga, pero maraming wrong. So, wrong ta wrong wronging sana yun, diba? <laughs> ngek, ngek, ngek. <laughs> marking, kaya nga word marking. Oh, or tawag natin checking. Okay? So, we're going to mark students' uh, scores. And it's, it's going to be automatic. Uh, in some applications that would allow uh, allow teachers and students to do online quizzes, feedback can also be automatic. It's also convenient to uh, students in an online assessment form. Also, computer marking and computer work in uh, tests such as selection or multiple choice type of test can be done in a jiffy. You can do automatic grading right away. There's automatic. A marking right away of answers, especially when it's just um, uh, uh, a knowledge-based test. You can reduce the marking time. Can you imagine that? The number of hours you spend marking can just be done in how many minutes in an online class in an online quiz application. There's also faster feedback because there's also a reduction of marking time. And what students like, which I really noticed uh, during summer term when I use a Microsoft form for our assessment. Uh, we can do or we can allow students to do multiple attempts. And teachers, I would really recommend you do multiple attempts. Bakit? Kasi in multiple attempts, this is where students actually learn. Kasi they will know that they have had a mistake. Therefore, the next time that they're going to do the test, they can now select the correct answer. And there's already that behavior through the correct answer that students learn. Kaya nga, uh, I would really suggest that you let them do multiple attempts. But maybe you can just record the final score. Out of three attempts, you score the last score. Or out of three attempts, you average the three attempts. And that is the score of the student. Win-win situation. Yan. You know that students are learning. And number two, students will like it as well because you allow them to do multiple attempts. Because my worry Kasi ang students, when they do online quizzes, nawawala yung connection, nawawala yung uh, internet. They will also have difficulty with um, answering kasi nga it's online, mostly connectivity issues. So you allow them for multiple attempts. Okay? Uh, it's okay naman because it's just, um, just knowledge-based questions. Di ba? Um, we will talk about um, what could be a better assessment strategy. But um, we could still not deny knowledge-based questions. Okay? They are still very helpful. Next, online assessment is also very beneficial because we could detect plagiarism. Diba? There are already plagiarism checker applications that could be used like Grammarly and um, what else there that is available uh, online that could detect plagiarism in students' reports. This is good for the teacher, not good for the student. Pero students should also realize that because we ask them to really share what they learned or what they know, they have to give us the correct or they have to give us their personal and also their own answers. And last, online gradebook. There could already be a way to do grade booking, which is more convenient for teachers and students. For example, 
um, the learning management system like Google Classroom already has a great book embedded in it. Therefore, you can just um, download the Excel file or the XLS file of the scores. And therefore, ta-da, you already have grades of students. That's why online assessment is actually very beneficial. Let's review the types of assessments. What are the two types of assessments, my dear friends? Formative and summative. Question, my dear friends, to check if you're still with me, because this is synchronous. Which is more important? Formative, which is on the process of learning, on the process of teaching, you are assessing students, and therefore they are not graded. Or summative assessment, in which you are grading students uh, formally, this is what you're going to place now in their grades. Which is more important, formative or summative? Can you place F in the chat box if you believe it's formative and you put S um, if you think that summative is more important? So I'm using the strategy of picking sides. Uh, Ms. Chini, can you help me check if they are the, the people are still with me? Ms. Chini? Yes, they're actually still with us. Thank you so much. Um, formative and summative. The answer, according to Deputy Order Number 8, Series of 2015, the most important type of assessment is formative assessment. Yay! Congratulations to those who answered formative. Sir, why is it that formative assessment is more important than summative, wherein formative assessment is not graded naman? That's the point. It's more important because it's what makes the summative assessment. Because without the formative assessment, we could not be sure that the summative assessment is a good assessment of students' learning. Kaya, we start with formative assessment. Formative assessment is more important than... A formative assessment is more important than summative assessment. Also, if we give the importance to formative assessment, we teachers will be reminded of the focus on learning. The focus on really letting students learn. Okay? Kaya nga, mas importante yung formative assessment. Now, um, we need to have strategies to do informative assessment online and summative assessment in an online setting. But first, let me give you some, strat uh, let me give you some, uh, some reminders that in online assessments, we have to support students. How do we support students? Number one. We allow practice in using the tool. Whatever tool that you are using to assess students, let students practice it. Okay? Number two, let students do trial. That's why uh, it's also possible to do multiple attempts. Then the first attempt could be the trial or the practice. Okay? And number three, teachers have a backup plan in case the technology fails in online assessment. Okay? These are reminders, my dear teachers. Now, some strategies in formative assessment, okay? Number one, or, um, this is number one because I would want you to really put this in your utak brain. The flow of the online class is not simply presenting the content that has never been the purpose of an online class, but rather the online class should be facilitative towards the learning of the content. What would be your purpose as a teacher if you're just going to to present the content and you haven't helped them, you haven't facilitated them as to which is the first one to read, which is the second one to read, what should they do to know if they really learn this material. That's why focus the flow of the online class towards the facilitation that students are learning. Okay, That's why formative tasks are important because these activities that would uh, help you as a teacher to facilitate their learning is a formative task in itself. Okay, Number two, you stop at certain points to check for understanding. Or maybe you can try some exercises like um, sit up because we're doing online. So stretch first. Okay, I hope you're also doing stretches there. Okay, Stretch your uh, legs, your arms, your neck if meron. Okay, next. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next, reflect on one's learning. Okay, reflect. Uh, that's also a strategy. Okay, you let them reflect. You also provide feedback. That's already a certain point. That's also a formative activity. You provide feedback. Very good. Ah, you're still with me. Or even an energy check. Okay? An energy check is already formative because when students or your listeners are not listening, are not of the good energy, then therefore they're not learning perhaps because they are not engaged. Right? Same Latin root, enga, engage, energy. Okay? 
Next, engage in tasks such as observations and insights of, re, uh, of learners, reporting insights. Teachers, we should not demean observations and insights. They are important. Okay? When you observe students, even in an online setting, you observe their responses, you observe their outputs, that alone is already formative. Or when you ask students of their insights, then they share to you or report to you their insights, reading their insights, or just asking how was the class, how are you, uh, how have you been doing, has the activity been difficult, what can you do, these are already insights. And that is already formative assessment. Okay? So don't forget that, dear teachers, these are more important than the grades and the, and the online tests and quizzes. Last strategy for formative strategy for formative online assessment is to let them compare their initial idea and to the changes in the ideas after your synchronous class. So example perhaps would be you ask the students, just like the strategy earlier, you ask them a question, then you don't answer the question yet. Then they have to listen to the synchronous class. Then you let them compare what they have, uh, what they have thought or you let them answer their question beforehand and let's check if they were able to answer it. That is already formative assessment. Even if it's found in the end, the, the, the way that it is formulated is still formative in its essence because we are trying to check on the previous idea. Okay? And that's nice. Yeah, that's still formative. And again, my dear teachers, formative assessment is more important than summative assessment. But I have here some strategies as well for summative assessment. The summative assessment is crucial, even if it's not important for Sir Ayo, because it's what is being shown as the grade or the marking of the student. So yeah, it, it seems important. But again, my dear teachers, don't forget that there should be formative strategies or formative assessment activities that were done so that we can prove that the summative assessment is the correct assessment of students' learning or the correct evaluation of students' learning, okay? First and foremost, I would like to remind you that there is a need to reassess assessment, meaning we have to change the way we think about assessment, especially in an online setting. Maybe we still have been thinking about assessment, which is on quizzes, knowledge-based, and if you come to think of it, it could be cheated. You cannot see students when they are answering the questions. They could open a new tab so that they could find the answer. They could open their notes on the side. Right? So the more that we should not make use of such tests, which are uh, knowledge-based tests, multiple choice, true or false, because it's cheatable. Ayo right now. So probably while Sir Ayo is fixing his technical difficulties as of this point, I'd like to remind all of you who are watching with us in YouTube to please refrain from commenting unnecessary or um, very trivial comments. And also, if you have questions for our speakers, please um, Leave a comment in the chat box or in the comment section. Sir Ayo, are you back? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Where did I stop? Miss Jeannie, where did I stop? Next slide, Sir no. Ayo. Oops. Uh, next slide. Oh, thank you. So again, formative assessment is more important than summative assessment. So again, a review of the strategies for formative assessment. Number one, the flow of the online class should be more on facilitating the learning content, not just on presenting the content. Number two, 
stop at certain points. Maybe to check understanding, try exercises, reflect on learning, provide feedback, energy check. Next, also do not demean the use of teacher observations and also on learning or hearing learners' insights. And a good strategy that I really like is when you ask students to compare what they learned before the class and then uh, the changes that happened after the class. Then let them compare their initial idea with their new idea. Let's go now to summative assessment. Again, summative assessment, as per Sir Ayo, sige, quote me on this na lang. <laughs> I, uh, I really believe that formative assessment is more important than summative assessment. But we could not also delineate summative assessment because it's what is shown in your report cards. It is what is shown in, as grades. And therefore, it's a proof uh, of students' learning. Kaya nga, we should, not, we should be careful when doing summative assessments. Okay? But again, we do formative assessments and we should do them well so that the summative assessment is a reflection of what students have learned during the formation of learning. Okay? Again, um, number one, strategy. Teachers, we need to reassess our assessment strategies. Because again, in this time of online learning, um, students might have um, the opportunity to show to you not what they learn. So they're just going to uh, check on their notes while they answer the multiple choice quiz that you have. They can open that another tab so that they can search on the answer. Then, because we have been thinking much about that, we teachers will also find ways so that they could not open a tab, so that it would be time-bound. So we are now adding pressure or anxiety to students, which is not the essence of assessment. The essence of assessment is to check if students have learned. So we should, not, we should get off those worries. Therefore, we have to reassess our assessment. Is a multiple-choice quiz of 40 items a good assessment for what I'm teaching to my students? About this topic? Or could there be a better assessment activity? Right? Need to reassess assessment. Number two, we need to stop assessing. Okay? We need to just distill from purified what then such students must learn. With the 70 competencies that you have to teach students in a particular year, let's say you're teaching grade seven. Which are the top 20? Parang Miss Universe lang, no? We need to select the top 20. We need to select the top 20 competencies lang that uh, students should gain from this subject. Kasi sila yung napaka-essential. Sila yung napaka-important. That's why DepEd has a document, MELC, Most Essential Learning Competencies. Okay? Next. Better if we ask students to do performance tasks. Okay? And performance items. We demand students to apply their knowledge we ask students to show to you that they learn not just answer items not just answer true or false test not just answer um, identification activities or questions better performance tasks okay and Maybe you are a long-term PBL project. And I am very proud with uh, my students, our students in the College of uh, School of Education who actually did a PBL project okay, last summer. Again, shout out to my students there for doing a good job. And thank you also to the teachers in the School of Education during that summer for having a PBL project. And we did a PBL project in three subjects. So just imagine that. Right? Why not? Right? That's possible. It's actually very good. It lessens the task of students and it hits the targets or the outcomes of the three subjects. Then move to a series of smaller events from a big one. Break part a performance task to mini tasks. So your mini tasks in the big performance task could actually be your formative activities. Okay. Then at the end of weeks or of your uh, subject, you could now have the bigger performance task output. That would be your summative assessment. Other strategies here. Use conversations and oral defense. Conversations and oral defense are actually good as strategies for summative assessment because confidence on what they understood and they were able to answer you, that alone is already a proof that they learned. Then teachers, please allow students to take time, okay? 
in the performance tasks. You should give them also ahead of time as well. Leverage technology tools. So make use of the technology tools that are available. In my case, I use Microsoft uh, Forms because they are actually very helpful for students reporting of what they know, essays also. Then last but not the least, teach academic honesty. And you, we need to trust our students. In the same way our students trusted us with what we are teaching them, we too have to trust our students. Also, last but not the, sorry, last but not the least, is to use professional judgment. You have to also identify for yourself if the grade or the summative evaluation that students will get is really what students have learned. And that involves professional judgment as teacher. These are some examples. Um, I gave feedback on the essay using Moodle. I gave um, objective tests through Microsoft Forms. And I use Angelica's um, post on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, Angelica. Hi, Angelica. Uh, when I gave feedback on their videos on Flipgrid. And they like the feedbacks. They like the idea that uh, I read, I view their um, outputs. Performance task using Microsoft Forms. Conversations as my midterm examination. I did an empathy talk with um, some people uh, in, the, in the field and also PBL-based oral defense tasks uh, when we did last summer. Here are some tools that I'm going to share with you. I'm almost out of time. I'm just going to present them to you um, shortly. First, um, let me skip this now. Microsoft Form is actually very good as an online form creation tool. It's same with Google Form. It's just that Microsoft Forms could actually be, um, could already have a template as to um, quizzes. And there's also good feedback. You can, you can feedback on individual responses and you can also get a total feedback or an analytics of the entire results of the quiz. You can also choose two in Microsoft Forms if it's a form or a quiz. So when it's quiz, you can actually time it and you can also grade it or score it. Next, Socrative. Socrative is an app which could be useful for formative quiz. Well, Microsoft Forms could be on objective tests and on performance tests, which are written. Socrative is formative because uh, it's just, um, it uses these features like quick question um, in, in which you give them that question and they answer it uh, quickly. There's also an exit, exit ticket that you can give the URL to students, then they will answer the exit ticket. You post a question as an exit ticket. Space race is also a good formative activity in which uh, students will race to the number of points by, pro by providing the app or the template with many questions. Then the, 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 the students with um, the many correct answers actually wins. You can also do rooms in Socrative for your, um, for your students. And there's also teacher-friendly reports and analytics as well, which you could, uh, export. Uh, in, uh, you could export from Socrative app. You could sign up for free. Next, Kahoot. This is very familiar. Kahoot is um, a student response app. So Microsoft Form is an objective form or quiz type, performance type app. Socrative is formative test app. Kahoot is a student response application or a game-based pedagogy, a pedagogy app. And I think a lot of teachers are familiar already with Kahoot. Um, what is nice about Kahoot is also its accessibility, the use of colors and shapes. If ever the student is colorblind, we, they can use the shape. You can also use size, sound, and timer as well. And it's very student-friendly. You could also use the new features of Kahoot like multi-select, Asynchronous mode of quiz, there's already that feature of Kahoot for practice and drills and open-ended questions. Kahoot is also a partner now of Microsoft. The last tool, which I also like, which I'm going to use uh, this semester, Shogi is an assignment submission or portfolio application. So I'm giving you these tools of different um, purposes. So Shobi is a submission application. So it's a one-stop place for giving and receiving feedback also of the assignments that were submitted to students. So just imagine a rack in your, in your table, teachers. That rack is Shobi, 
in an application in which you could organize in folders uh, the assignments of students. You could also give right away feedback to the student submissions, maybe through written, markings, and even verbal feedback. You can also compile the student's works in a portfolio, an e-portfolio. And Shopee is also very good with mobile gadgets. Just to end my talk for this evening, and I hope you've learned a lot from my talk this evening, uh, tips for... Um, tips for a growth mindset we need to remind ourselves that in this uh in this online setting we need already to uh, always consider uh, the growth mindset more than the fixed mindset okay meaning we need to be open with change both teachers and students alike we need to set out feedback we need to catch ourselves from time to time if ever we have the fixed mindset okay uh, use setbacks as an opportunity to understand, improve the next time, focus on the process of learning rather than the outcomes or the summative grade. And last but not the least, instructor presence. I'm going to go back to my first topic. Instructor presence actually is equal to empathy. So when you show that you are there with students, it actually means also that you are very empathetic with students. Uh, Hattie 2008 demonstrated that one of the most powerful ways to impact student achievement is teacher-student relationships, specifically variables of empathy, warmth, and encouragement. And this is applicable in all settings, face-to-face -face or online. So, three pillars of humanizing online learning, presence, empathy, and awareness of students' needs. Thank you so much. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be your speaker for tonight. Ms. Jeannie. Thank you so much, Sir Ayo, for the amazing strategies that you have given us. You have also given us um, some assessment tools or technology tools that we can use in our classes. This time, uh, there are some questions that our viewers have posted and i have here a question that is specifically for sir paul is sir paul still with us oh. hi sir paul good evening thank you for still being with us i have here a question that is for you this um here uh here it is sir in online teaching how do teachers navigate successfully considering the learners' multiple intelligences, multicultural, and diversity? Okay, a uh, good question. Bloom do have a... Uh, Bloom ha uh, the Bloom's taxon do have a corresponding digital tools. They can search that. One thing to be engaging and one thing to target the multiple intelligences in an online or in remote teaching and learning is to be varied in terms of to be varied in terms of application that we are using. So that's one thing that we can do is to be varied in terms of the activities that we are giving to them or to their applications and online tools that we are using. So it's not all the time that we'll be using Padlet, of course, not all the time that we'll be using Mentimeter, but we need to be varied also in terms of the products that we are using so that we can maximize the different multiple intelligences, hinging from the idea also of differentiated instruction. So thank you for that question. Okay, thank you so much, Sir Paul, for that. Again, we need to use varied applications no? so that we'd be hitting the different intelligences of our learners there. Now, I have another question that is specifically addressed for Sir Ayo. This is something to do with formative versus summative. Which one is more important? No? So, there is a question here that if formative assessment is more important, po, then why is it that it is not recorded? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, I like the question also because it drives the point. So uh, formative, assessment, uh, formative assessment is not graded because it's still in the process of formation. So therefore, whatever it is that is being formed in students shouldn't be graded because again, it's not yet final. But again, the most important thing there is that because it's not yet final, but the students, um, the students' own discovery that they are actually learning in the process should be what should be highlighted rather than the grade. Correct. 
Okay, thank you so much, Sir Ayo. Again, Correct. it's the process. <laughs> Correct. Well, <Yes>. <laughs> It's the process of learning that you want to assess, right? That's right, uh, sir. Uh, Ayo. Yes. So, Thank you. So, really learning. Because again, mm. if I if I remember it right, sir, I mentioned that it's very easy for us to cheat for the summative test because we are we want to have a good grade. We want to have a high grade, mm. no? So, um, it's prone to cheating. So, it's formative assessment, no? But that's a very good question. Thank you so much. This time, again, as much as we would really want to um, answer more questions, this time, we'll have our trivia. So for our trivia, again, please prepare your hands and your brain. If you have listened to our speakers this evening, you will be, a, and you will be the first one to answer. Again, the first person that I see based here on my um, screen will be the winner. I apologize and congratulations in advance. So I have here two questions from the talks of our two highly esteemed speakers. If you're ready, please type ready in the live chat. And you will win 100 pesos worth of GCash. You just have to send us a message once your name is called. You send us your GCash account number and your name and we'll be sending you your prize. Are you ready? Okay, so it seems that a lot of people are ready to win some G cash right now. Okay, the first question. Wait, you cannot answer not unless I say go. Okay, so I will only honor the answer right after I say go. Before, okay, for a while. Before, three R's, as mentioned by our speaker earlier. Before, Three R's meant repetition, routinary, and relaxation. But in the new normal, in the new normal, three R stands for different, uh, three different things. So when we say, what do the three R stands for in the new normal based on the talk of Sir Paul Go. What does the three R stands for based on the talk of Sir Paul? Correct. Sir, Sister Riza. Sister Riza prayed a lot tonight because she won the trivia for tonight. Sister Riza Sindangan. That's correct. Rules, rules, and routines. That's right, Sir Paul, di ba? The three R's of the new normal. Yes, yes. Okay, no, 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 no. thank you so much. Good job, sister. This time, our next, kind of please send your GCash account so that you we will be sending the money tonight. Next. But I'd like to acknowledge that many of you really were able to get the correct answer. So you were all listening. Good job. If I only have a lot of money, I will send all of you GCash right now. Okay, so now... I have another question. This comes from the talk of Sir Ayo. This means creating the perception that the teacher is with the students in the process of learning online or not. Go. The answer is... The answer is, Sir Ayo has been mentioning this. Correct! Miss Cecil Alvarez got the correct answer and she typed it first. The answer is, instructor presence. You've been repeating this earlier during Sir Ayo's talk. You even typed it without looking as he mentioned. No, so again, the winner for the next question of the G for the Gcash load is... Miss Cecil Alvarez. Miss Cecil Alvarez, please send us a message so that we'd be able to get your GCash account number. Thank you so much to everyone who has been listening and for being very participative. Um, 
and engaged no, in our webinar this evening. Before I before we end tonight and before I turn the screen over to our dean, I'd like to call to give an advert to give um a short ad no for tonight. I'd like to call one of the faculty members from the special education department of the college of uh, the school of education, Mr. Jare Galieto. Sir Jare, good evening. Good evening, Ms. Chin. Good evening, everyone. As other children enter this school year in a very new and challenging environment, let us not forget that children with special needs must also be included and be given access to this new world of education. St. Isabel Moreno Special Learning Center, the SPED Center of the School of Education of the University of San Jose Recoletos, continues to support these unique learners in this new normal. We provide special education instruction to children with special needs. We cater to students with Autistic Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, intellectual disabilities including Down Syndrome, ADHD, learning disabilities, and multiple disabilities. New in our department is schools. School stands for SPED Center to Home Optimal Online Solutions. We aim to bring specialized instruction to children with special needs into their homes. Schools is our response to the uncertainty in special education caused by the pandemic. In this new normal, we offer an array of programs in exclusive one-on-one -on -one settings through online sessions. Our programs are IEP-based, and we provide various opportunities for the students to learn not only in academic skills, but also in significant home living skills. Our special educators who are experienced in providing individualized and specialized instruction adapt their classroom lessons to online classes. They conduct online classes that are fully interactive, motivating student participation, thus engaging the students while sustaining their attention. Because providing special education through online means isn't something new to most, if not all students and parents, we offer one week free trial of classes for those interested, free of any charge, an obligation to enroll. Please contact Ms. Eva Maria Divina Gracia in 0917 798 for more information. You may also send your message through the USJR School of Education Hallway FB page. Thank you and have a blessed night. Thank you so much, Sir Jore. Again, we invite you all to enroll and research more about our special education department in the University of San Jose Recoletos. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, to give the synthesis and the closing um, message for tonight, I'd like to call our dean, Dr. Justoni Babia. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ms. Chini. And once again, thank you so much for watching our COE Learn at Home webinar series. Um, if you notice that I did not prepare a synthesis for this evening, it's because um, uh, I will use this opportunity to thank all of you for continue for your continued support um, in our COE Learn at Home webinar series. So before anything else, I'd like to thank Sir Paul and at the same time, um, Sir Ayunel for really giving us a very thorough insight about how to teach innovatively using the different pedagogy and the right approach to teaching and learning process that will actually be useful no, in the utilization um, of uh, in, in answering to the different problems that we encounter in this pandemic. So as what I've said, po, since it's Buwan ng Wika right now, so some of you are also requesting me to speak in Tagalog, especially for those who are our viewers, not only in Visayas and Mindanao, but also in, in Luzon, no? So, uh, magpapasalamat po kami sa inyong lahat sa patuloy na pagsubaybay sa aming COE Learn at Home Webinar Series. Um, just for everyone to know, um, pansamantala po kaming mamamaalam sa inyong lahat 
at naway naging masaya at maunlad ang inyong pakikisama sa amin sa apat na buwan na inyong pamamalagi at taos-puso pagsuporta sa aming COE Learn at Home Webinar Series. Um, inaasahan po or asahan po ninyo na babalik po kami at asahan din po ninyo na palalakasin at palalawakin po namin ang aming pagbabahagi ng mga mahahalagang konsepto at kaalaman na napatutungkol sa mga strategiya, konsepto, bagong teorya um, ng facilitating teaching at learning. So bago po kami magpaalam, um, nais ko po sanang i-request ang ating ng mga staff uh, na bumubuo sa ating COE Learn at Home Webinar Series. Um, starting off with our technical director, um, Sir Wendell. Where are you, Sir Wendell? Can I see you, Sir Wendell? And can you say something to all our viewers um, nationwide? So anything that you would like to say? Um, any words of thanks to mm -hmm. our um, friends? Not at sir. Okay. Um, to all our viewers, to all our beloved and empowered viewers, uh, thank you so much for your undying support. At the same time, thank you so much for your active participation of our Learn of the of our USGR School of Education Learn at Home webinar series as part of our as part of the technical committee. Uh, we are so grateful of your feedbacks and comments during our FB Live and YouTube Live because it helped us a lot to improve so with that thank you so much and adelante thank you so much sir wendell adelante and of course of the coe learn at home webinar series the one who is actually answering all your queries all your questions and of course we will still be active 24 hours and it's because of this one very important person is actually manning our school of education um official page um sir ayo do you have um anything uh to say uh words of thanks and appreciation to all our viewers Thank you, Sir Bob, for the opportunity. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we would like to say goodbye for now as we are going to end or cut short the, uh, the second series. Uh, instead of the eight sessions, we will have seven sessions because of um, how busy we are with the university preparation. So I hope you understand. Um, but um, we really thank you for the chance and opportunity to serve you through these uh, content that we are sharing every Friday night. And I am very glad to serve you all while answering your queries in the set page and in the emails. And uh, with that, um, uh, we hope that you continue to work with us also as we continue to provide content uh, in the months to come. Uh, maybe we are planning actually to have once a month na lang, but uh, please give us time to um, finalize first uh, all details especially that we are still um, in the process also of working on our university requirements in our LMS. Um, we have to cater first to our requirements in the university before we could serve you better, uh, our dear um, co-Friday learners. Um, just a reminder, uh, as I'm going to spend the time also or the opportunity, um, certificate of completion will still be available. Um, for those who have joined us from sessions one to seven. If you haven't watched um, some of the sessions, you can still um, view the YouTube uh, videos of sessions one to seven of series two. Then you can still catch up with um, the, the series and therefore you can still get a certificate of completion. Okay? Um, more instructions will be presented this Monday. For now, let's just um, have the certificate of participation for tonight's session. Okay? And I'm here still at your service. Sir Bob? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir Ayo. Um, of course, um, we also have Sir Montano here. Sir Montano is actually at home with her, together with his wife. So, Sir Montano, do you have anything to say? Sir Montano, um, maybe you will just uh, be replacing me here. Sir Montano, you can say something. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening. In behalf of USJR College of Education, we would like to say thank you so much for watching our CUE Learn at Home webinar series and hope you will continue to support our next session, which is next month. Thank you so much. Adelante. Yeah.
<laughs> All right. So thank you so much. So um, I guess uh, we don't have um, any more staff here. So again, po, muli maraming maraming salamat po. Um, hopefully, we can still provide you with um, the best and the latest topics about education. And we will also be partnering with other universities and institutions. We will work for it. And at the same time, we will also be aiming to provide the more relevant, highly relevant, and highly um, specialized topics that every one of you can surely um relate to so maraming 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 salamat po and hanggang sa muli thank you very much ayo will be there to answer your